round out public opinion polling and what it what it tells us. And so uh, we want to mention specifically uh, a kind of a, a throwback to the beginning of the year. One of the things we find out when we conduct our public opinion polls, uh, we measure or, or try to figure out the the source of a lot of our values. Okay. Uh, where do people get the ideas and values that they have? And uh, remember, the, the passing of values from one generation to the next, we call that political socialization. And remember, uh, the family has the, the biggest impact uh, on your political socialization. One of the best ways to figure out why you are the way you are is to look at how your parents have raised you. Uh, what do they believe and why do they believe it? And that will dictate to you in a lot of ways uh, why you are the way you are. Uh, our schools pass on those. Remember, religious institutions, mass media, those help in shaping who we are. And uh, political polls kind of bear that out. And I'll show you some of those values probably tomorrow. But right now we want to get back into it. Uh, we mentioned this yesterday, um, but it's worth mentioning again. Uh, change in public opinion is very slow unless there's some type of dramatic event. Okay. Public opinion is generally very slow to change. People usually have, uh, I mean, fairly strong feelings about a particular issue, uh, and they're slow to back off that. However, over time, as people get older, they learn to see things a little bit differently. And uh, generations, succeeding generations, are more prone to, to changing their minds than necessarily uh, the older generation of an era. All right. So change in public opinion, generally slow unless there's a dramatic event. Now, something else we want to mention here, too, um, public opinion and its effect on policy. OK, does what the public want, uh, does what the public wants, is that relevant to lawmakers and uh, people who are running for office? Uh, the answer is undoubtedly yes. OK, public opinion on a particular issue will help shape policy. All right. And not just uh, like it helps determine the salience, what issues we're going to deal with first. All right. And then it helps determine which way we're going to break on that uh, to a more conservative response or to a more liberal response. So, like, for example, right now, um, COVID relief, businesses have been shut down or limited. Uh, individuals have lost their jobs or financially have been struggling uh, because of COVID and the shutdowns that have happened across the country. And so right now. Uh, we're trying to determine uh, what it is that, that we should be doing to help out our citizens. And uh, um, right now, the government is taking a very Keynesian approach, where, remember, Keynes said uh, when things are difficult, times are tough, the government needs to inject money into the system, uh, spend those tax dollars, right? And right now, uh, we're seeing our potentially second COVID relief bill that's looking at spending a trillion dollars, and Republicans don't necessarily like doing this, but they also see that they don't have a choice. All right. If you're a Republican and you don't like this bill, you swallow your pride and you vote for it anyway, because what happens if you don't? You're going to have a lot of angry voters. OK, because the covid relief bill doesn't just provide a stimulus check to individuals. It provides money to small businesses. Democrats and Republicans are affected by the COVID crisis. And we're not just talking about the disease itself, we're talking about financially. So uh, it definitely, because this is the most salient issue and people have strong feelings about this, they're like, hey, the government ordered the shutdown. Ultimately, the government bears some responsibility for this. All right. And so you're going to see that public opinion definitely has an effect on policy because lawmakers who don't respond uh, they're going to pay a price for it, especially about an issue this important. Uh, Democrats and Republicans both see COVID as perhaps the number one issue. All right. You have to realize that public opinion will definitely impact what lawmakers do and how they prioritize it. All right. So you don't necessarily go by public opinion all the time, but you have to take it into account because if you don't, voters will hold you accountable. OK. Now, uh, polls in America, one of the biggest things is that uh, people look at polls and, and uh, they let polls make the decisions for them. OK, one of the biggest criticisms of public opinion polls is that uh, they, you know, politicians don't make the hard decisions themselves. 
they see which way the wind is blowing and they simply do what the public wants because they'd rather be liked than actually make hard decisions. All right. That's one of the big criticisms of public opinion polls. OK, sometimes people are also critical of public opinion because they say, hey, things like exit polls, particularly at election time, uh, they can help sway people. They can cause people to stay home. Uh, if you think, for example, if you see a poll that says that Donald Trump uh, has uh, about a 70 to 30 percent advantage in the polls in West Virginia, a lot of people are like, well, why should I go vote? Uh, if I already know who's going to win in this state, then why bother voting at all? all? Right. So people are critical of those exit polls uh, and they're critical of polls in general that might sway public leaders to do something rather than forming their own opinions about what the right thing to do is. OK, now polls. Remember, we said that one of the things that uh, polls do or what they reveal uh, is public opinion. OK, and, and that's important because we want to know what people think so lawmakers can get an idea of what's what matters to them. All right. But remember, we have to figure out if those opinions are justified or not. And what polls reveal about people's knowledge is that they don't know nothing. All right. And yes, I just used a double negative. OK, uh, if you get a chance and you got your textbook, take a look at page 362 and you're going to see that public awareness of political events is not good. Uh, even if you don't have your book, it, uh, just bear with me for a minute and I'll tell you some of the things in here. Uh, when they poll people, sometimes they'll just ask them, who's the Speaker of the House of Representatives? All right. And right now it's Nancy Pelosi. But a lot of people don't know that. All right. Or they say that they don't like Nancy Pelosi, but they don't know why other than she's a liberal. And the same is true of Donald Trump. Uh, some people don't know certain facts about the president, the vice president, or on this chart on figure 11.2, uh, they don't know things that, you know, for example, that most people know, like only 62% of people knew who the Speaker of the House was. Uh, only 37% of the people knew what the unemployment rate was at the time or who Neil Gorsuch was. So, you know, the stuff that we that we, you know, think is important or that really is important in life or in government, at least people don't know that. But they know all the dumb stuff in the world that they like, uh, you know, that they shouldn't know or nobody cares about or at least it's not that important. So, you know, for example, like I bet that if you're listening to this and I say Rick and Morty, you know exactly who I'm talking about. Or if I mention the TV show South Park, you can name at least two or three characters on South Park. Or if I mention music artists who are big, or if I mention, uh, you know, some controversial, uh, something controversial that a movie star did or whatever. We know all about pop culture, but we don't know about the people who are making laws and rules uh, about how we have to live. Right. Our political knowledge is not all that great. And what we see is a lot of voters go into the polls and they don't know Jack. All right. Now, a few other trends that we want to mention real fast. Uh, you know, something that, that has uh, bothered a lot of government officials uh, that polls have revealed is that there is a major decline in the trust in government. And you look over time, and this one, uh, this little chart only goes to 2004, but when you see the trends over time, uh, it's still going to be a distrustful type of attitude. Uh, they've asked people consistently, um, how often do you think you can trust the people, the government in Washington, D.C., to do what's right? Just about always, most of the time, or only some of the time, or, or never, right? And you can see that you go back to the 50s, and that's why I like this chart in particular. The 50s and 60s, up until then, uh, most people said you had, a, I mean, like you had almost 60% of the people saying you can trust the government to do what's right most of the time. When you add in the always figure, like look at the high water mark here in the early 60s, you had 10 to 15% of the people saying you can trust the government to do what's right always. And then you got uh, another 60% saying most of the time. So, you know, you had three quarters of the people in 1964 saying you can trust the government to do the right thing. All right. But now take a look. All right. That look in the early 90s, uh, that red line, people who said you can never trust the government or you can only trust them some of the time. I mean, is it like 80 percent? I mean, it's just ridiculous. All right. People didn't trust the government. And there's reasons for that. Most of them have to do with historical events. OK, things like like you look at the change. Uh, that red line is going up in the 60s, 
because there are so many crazy historical events. You look at the Watergate scandal. You look at the Vietnam era and all the inappropriate activities that occurred there. Lyndon Johnson lying to get us into the war, atrocities committed by soldiers, uh, things that get covered up. Um, we find out that both sides, Democrats and Republicans, when they're in charge of the government, uh, they do stuff that's shady. And when you do shady things like that, people don't want to trust you anymore. All right? And those historical events have led to a uh, divided government, where you have Democrats uh, sometimes holding one or both houses of uh, office and Republicans holding, uh, or excuse me, they have one house in Congress and uh, the other party will control the presidency. All right? And divided government leads to people not trusting the government either, where you get, uh, you know, when you have a divided government, things don't always get done, and one side just blames the other. Democrats blame Republicans, and Republicans blame Democrats. So uh, that's what's happened in the last couple of years of Trump's presidency. He and Republicans who controlled the Senate said it's the Democrats' fault we can't get anything done. Democrats who controlled the House of Representatives look at Republicans and say they don't want to get anything done. All right? And people get annoyed with the government when gridlock occurs. And so divided government, historical events, it leads us to no longer trust the government. Okay. Now, there are consequences of us not trusting the government anymore. Okay. And you're seeing that now, in particular in the last year or two, uh, where the Trump administration has called into question uh, you know, anybody who uh, questions this administration. There are consequences of that. What do you think happens when uh, people don't trust the government to do what's right? Number one, what do they do less frequently? They don't come out to vote as often, all right? This election was a little bit different because Trump is such a, a controversial figure, but by and large, uh, people don't come out to vote. And even in this election, they're projecting about a 67, 68% voter turnout nationwide. And that's the highest voter turnout we've had in 100 years, all right? But even then, you only have two out of three people, eligible voters, coming out to vote. A third of the American people still said, I'd rather just stay at home, even though voting was the easiest it's ever been in this country's history, all right? So one of the consequences of us not trusting the government is the fact that, uh, you know, people don't come out to vote, okay? Another big consequence of us not trusting the government is you get an increase in alternative forms of political activity. And we mean things like not just protesting, but rioting, or people doing outrageous things that you've not seen in terms of government before, uh, you know, bringing loaded rifles to a protest or a march, or people uh, refusing to wear, uh, you know, or people having super spreader events. Uh, on their own so that everybody can get COVID and uh, eventually get herd immunity, right? People try to participate in ways that we don't consider normal. Uh, these are more offbeat type ways of participating in the process. And so, you know, with the COVID events, people think, well, you know what, it's all a hoax anyway, and we don't trust the government. Uh, therefore, we'll have our own event, we'll get herd immunity, and we don't need the government to handle this. All right. So this is what polls are revealing to us, and this is information that's important to the political process. We'll pick up with this uh, tomorrow, y'all, and then we'll get into other ways that you can participate in the political process.